Hello. This lecture will be um, will be covering the teleological or intelligent design argument by Richard Swinburne, and as we do that, we'll be looking at the objections by uh, Robin Lepoy Le Devent, <clears throat> um, and I'll be using the rationale argument maps, and that information is on the website, how you can access it. It's $30 a year for an annual subscription, but you can also look at these maps uh, free of charge if you register with the account. So uh, here we go. The first, I think, nice way to start this lecture is with this image. So the Super Bowl, uh, you know, began with a coin toss, right? And the idea is that it's fair because when you flip the coin, you know, heads or tails, it's going to be 50-50. Now imagine, though, imagine, though, that the uh, <clears throat> Kansas City Chiefs, you know, and, and they, they really should have won. Imagine that, um, here we go, that the Chiefs player here had a, had a piece of equipment on where that player could know every single condition what we call initial condition of the coin before it was tossed. So that, that player would know, uh, you know, the weight of the coin, um, you know, the difference between the head side and the tail side, uh, the wind speed, the exact angle of the thumb. You know, the referee is the one who's flipping it, right? Uh, exactly the, the, he knew everything, almost an omniscient perspective, um, knowing everything about the thumb, how fast it would flip, uh, the angle at which the thumb would hit the coin. If the Chiefs player knew absolutely everything about the coin, okay, um, down to like every, down to the atomic level, all the details using this special uh, equipment here, uh, then, then, uh, then it wouldn't be 50-50. Then the uh, Chiefs player would actually know uh, with full certainty, 100%, whether or not it would be heads or tails. So, right now, and thus, right, and thus God does not exist. Okay, this is going to be part of Lapoy Devan's argument. Um, I'm just trying to hook you into this a little bit. Uh, keep in mind, you know, you might wonder, well, when, why do we, why do we do this, right? Because nobody, whoops, because nobody actually is interested in developing that kind of equipment, and I don't think we, we could pull it off. Uh, we just don't have the ability to know all the initial conditions. But if we did, it wouldn't be a 50-50 chance. It would be either a zero chance or a 100% chance. All right, uh, now, before we get into the argument here, I want to show you uh, the big picture. And this is the big picture of the universe. This is a, a handout I use in environmental ethics. And it works like this. Imagine that uh, we're going to create a map, like a literal, like a Google map kind of thing, like a road map. And that map in terms of miles, right? Miles, feet, inches, millimeters, whatnot. That map uh, will be uh, proportionate to time. Okay, so the distance, the driving distance, the walking distance from point A to point B, we're going to make an analogy, will be equivalent to the time. So imagine that the universe, the universe itself begins, let me make it a little bigger for you, um, it, it begins in Bakersfield. Like Bakersfield is when the universe begins, 13.8 or 81 billion years ago. Um, and then from Bakersfield, you drive up to Modesto. Okay, that's a 310 mile drive from Bakersfield to Modesto. I Googled it for this, this handout. At Modesto is when the Earth would be created. Okay, that just gives you a sense of, of the time, okay? Now, let me just say that when you hear words like million, billion, trillion, often our eyes glaze over. Like, what does that really mean? Can we put a, can we visualize that in any way? Um, 
So here's a way to visualize it. The universe begins with a big bang in, in Bakersfield, and then you and then as you're driving from Bakersfield to Modesto, time is unfolding. Galaxies are evolving. And in Modesto you have the beginning of the Earth. Now from Modesto, and you you can see it here, we're now going to drive into the Sierras. And um, and I use this because I, I teach a class up in the High Sierra Institute near Kennedy Meadows. Uh, if you know where the Dardanelles are, uh, or Dardanelle is, or if you know, boy, um, well, you'll, you'll get a sense of it. But it's about a two-hour drive from Modesto. So at Modesto, we have the beginning of, um, of the Earth. And then we're going to drive through Oakdale and Riverbank, up to Jamestown, Sonora, Twain Heart. I, I think most of you are familiar with this area, up to Strawberry. And then we're going to arrive here at the High Sierra Institute, also called Baker Station, near Kennedy Meadows. Okay, let's go into a little more detail here. And also, let's look at our key. Uh, the 310 miles is is the age of the universe. So, so I misspoke. It's not 310 miles from Bakersfield to Modesto. The entire trip is 310 miles. One mile is going to equal 44 and a half million years. And on that time scale, on this map, your life, let's say you live to be 75, your life is about 2.7 millimeters. Like, how big is that? I don't have my ruler with me, but that's pretty dang small. Like that's how that's how long you're gonna live in this large context. A uh, 0.036 millimeters will be one year. And here we got Bakersfield to Baker Station. Now, let's see if I can move this up for you. I think I can. All right. So, uh, whoops. So what do we have here? Um, let's do this. I see the problem. All right, thanks for bearing with me there. All right, so we have um, uh, we have. There we go. All right, so we have. It's not doing what I want it to do. All right, so we have Bakersfield. Uh, 206 miles from Modesto, and then the Earth is formed. That's 4.6 billion years ago. Then on Highway 108, right between Riverbank and Riverbank and Oakdale, is when you would have the emergence of simple cells, um, of simple life. Okay, and there, um, on the argument map, on the rational map, you'll see a link to a really cool video you can watch of like what it's like to be a cell. That is 14 miles, like, outside of Modesto. Then Donald Lake. Two miles before you hit Donald Lake is when we get simple animals. Um, so simple cells to simple animals. So simple animals would be one-celled creatures. Um, they, can, they can move on their own. I think that's the, I think that's the idea. That's uh, 600 million years ago. That's 90 miles. Okay, that's 90 miles outside Modesto, right? So we've driven 206 miles from Bakersfield to Modesto. That's the beginning, beginning of the universe. Now the Earth forms at Modesto. Now 90 miles further into the Sierras, right? Now we get simple animals. Just think about that. That means, what, let's do the math here, 296 miles out of our 310 mile journey, that's when we get simple animals. Now, two miles after Donald Lake, we have plants, insects, and seeds. Interesting. Plants, insects, and seeds. Uh, that's 450 million years ago. Look, four miles past the 90s. Now we're 94 miles outside of Modesto, right? Let's keep track of this. And that is. Um, and that is 300 and let's see, that's 290, that's 300, that's 300 miles out of our 310. Okay, good, I was worried about the math. Now mammals, 
and what we call sentience, and sentience is awareness. The, and awareness also includes the ability to feel. You really can't feel something, like even a pain, if you're not aware, right? So we call that sentience. That's another little question mark there. Maybe, you know, maybe amphibians, reptiles. Hmm, I think they also can feel. So that's why there's a question mark there. But you get the picture. That's 200 million years ago. That's 99 miles past Modesto. And now the total trip here we're talking is, uh, what is that? Uh, 305 miles out of our, out of our 310. Like this stuff really appeared like, looks like fairly late in the game. All right, let me um, make this slightly smaller so I can raise it up here. And well, it keeps doing that. Um, or I'll lower this, we'll get this. All right, now, now the rest of this, let's finish it up on uh, the big picture of uh, flowers. Wow, flowers appear after mammals. Like that means like, I guess there are little mice running around, little little mammals and they didn't have flowers. It's kind of, you know, nature just wasn't as pretty back then. <laughs> okay, that's 130 million years ago, 101 miles. Now Homo, homo, uh, homo habilis, which is a uh, um, an ancestor of our species, Homo sapiens sapiens. 2.5 million years ago. Now, you know, Homo sapiens. So when do we appear? You know, if if God created us, like, when do humans appear? Per, um, you know, per the evidence of evolution and physical anthropology, that appears a hundred thousand years ago. And and you know, that's a give or take. Okay, there's some there's some debate around the edges on this exactly when. Now, that is. 103.99773 miles. What? Yeah, 103.9973 miles outside Modesto. So on our total journey, let's add that together. We have two, almost 310, right? Almost 310. The universe is 310 miles old, the whole thing. We appeared at... 309 miles, 0.9973. Now over here, like, it's hard to imagine that. That's 12 feet before we get to our, our destination. Before we get to the present, out of our 310 mile journey, we appeared 12 feet. Like 12 feet before the end. We're really like new to the scene, our species. But we're not done yet. Now we get uh, agriculture and civilization roughly 10,000 years ago or large scale societies. And by the way, you know, the main religions, the big, the big religions that we study in the class, to the exclusion of small indigenous, uh, small scale um, uh, 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 spiritual religious traditions would be like Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism. You know, these are generally uh coextensive with part of large scale civilizations this is one foot before <clears throat> our uh, destination 10,000 years ago 103.99982 and then the industrial revolution right this happens starting in 1750 1780 um that's 9 millimeters <laughs> You know, and the, and the Industrial Revolution, you know, this is really what frames our modern world that, we're, that we know and live in. And, and that's 250 years ago, 103.9999, that's 9 millimeters. And then you, you're not, you're not 75 yet, right? You're like a third of this, right? So you're like, like you're like one millimeter old. Given the big picture of a 310 mile long universe, you're, you're one millimeter old, right? And then, and then, um, you know, the United States has been around roughly nine millimeters. And civilization, agriculture and civilization, uh, for one foot. And then our species for 12 feet.
So that's the big picture. What we can clearly see is that for much of the universe existence and the Earth's existence for like 90 miles of it, it was basically like slime. Like a lot of it was slime, right? We have the emergence of life. Yeah, early on, 14 miles in Riverbank, uh, 14 miles after Modesto, but we don't really get to simple animals until another, what's the math there? 60, 70 miles? 76 miles, right? All right, I hope that gave you a nice a nice sense of the big picture. And now on to the Swinburne and Lapoy de Ven argument. And let me move this into place. <clears throat> now, right now this looks kind of simple. One box, you'll see what's going to happen. It's going to get quite complicated, so bear with me. This rationale map is available for you on the website as well. You have to click on it, and if you have an account, which is free, you can then view it and play with it. And I'll make comments about, um, you know, the tools of philosophy, why we do argument mapping. But really, I, I think that I feel really satisfied having done this. Like, I feel like I really, I really have a sense of, I, I, I really feel like I've mastered and understand, like, the best argument anyone could put forth for the existence of God that's a teleological or design argument. And I also feel like in this map, I, I can look at the strongest counterargument to that. So I feel like I'm, I'm done on this, right? If you, if you come across anything that can improve on this, please let me know. Extra credit there. All right. Uh, there's a little couple of things to know. If you see a one single green dot, it means that that claim only weakly supports what's above it, in my opinion. And I'll try to comment on that as we go through this. If you see like one red square, that means it like weakly opposes what's above it. And if you watch my prior video on um, Taylor versus Mackey, you'll you kind of have a sense of how this works. But you'll get it. You'll get a handle of it. You know, basically, re quick recap: if you see something in green, it's a reason to support what's above. Something in red, right? It's a reason against. It's an oppositional claim of what's above. And then if you see something in orange. It means it's something opposed to the to what's opposed. That's right. So I can like give a, a premise or reason to support something that's in green. In red, if I say something that's an objection or the philosopher does, then it's in red. And if it's in orange, it's an objection to the objection. Here we go. It says here, here's Swinburne, here's Lapoy de Venn. Um, it's rational to believe that God exists. It's rational to believe that. Um, and Okay, just removing that. Um, and this is called the teleological. That comes from Aristotle. It means final cause or purpose, you know, or intelligent design, right? So the idea is that um, the general argument, right, is that the universe is very complex, life's very complex, and just like objects are complex, this is like a very complex timer. Now it's gonna go off. Um, just like these things are complex, and then therefore had a designer, life's complex, and therefore it must have a designer. It's like a simple analogy. That's the simple version of the design argument, intelligent design argument, uh, first, you know, well formulated by William Paley in the 18th century. Um, so this says Richard Swinburne, and he'll be uh, going against Robin Lapoy de Ven. And there's Robin and there's Richard. All right, what are our initial um, reasons supporting this? And let me, oh, good, I only have, whoops, I only have three. And it says here, 1A, uh, the probability of ultimate LTLTL. Now, I'm using labels and, and uh, labels here, or acronyms, sometimes to make it easier to like track concepts as we're moving through the argument. The probability of the ultimate LTLTL is caused by God, that would be a supernatural cause, is just a much greater probability than the LTLTL happening due to purely natural causes. For Occam's Razor, Occam's Razor says, whenever you're, you have two optional um, explanations, choose the one with fewer assumptions, which is usually the one that's simpler. Although what 
what, what counts as simple is, is actually a bit arbitrary. So I think the nice way to say it is whatever has fewer assumptions built into it. That you should just always go with the with the explanation, the causal explanation that's fewer assumptions. So what's LTLTL? Like what is that? Let's just take a look here. And by the way, you'll be able to access this this exact um, you know map. Maybe you have it open now, right? And I'm going to go through quickly in the recording because you can always pause this at any time. So this is not exactly like a lecture, right? Where people you know raise their hands and ask questions. I'll try to go quickly and. And I'll try my best to stay on the point. All right. So there's uh, ultimate LTL. It stands for laws that lead to life. I just grabbed that from the, the Swinburne reading. Like that's Swinburne's terms. And as someone who's reading his text and then I'm reconstructing his argument, like on this program, um, I'm also sometimes like paraphrasing his views or assigning labels to them. And I do that so that I can more easily like understand his argument and check that I understand it and later evaluate it. Um, you know, you're, if you see me doing anything you think is, um, you know, a foul here with, with Richard Swinburne, please email me. And if you're right, I'll give you extra credit. How much? I don't know, but uh, I'll do that. Okay, so the ultimate, you know, the laws that lead to life. Okay, that's nice, right? Gravity, strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and electromagnetism. There's four of them. These ultimate laws are the initial conditions for the, for the development of life. And, and here's a nice little like image of that. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger for you. Um, you know, gravity, the apple from the tree, electromagnetism. You know what that is. Just, you know, uh, electricity, right? Magnets. Uh, weak and strong interactions. These only happen at the uh, nuclear level, at the subatomic level. So we don't, we don't perceive these at our level, but they exist. Uh, these two we do. You know, there's a big project in physics to unify all these into like an ultimate single force. Um, okay, so that's what LTLTL means, right? It means laws that lead to life. That's a very important concept. And I think um, Swinburne's really smart. Like you'll see, like I really appreciate this. I think he's really smart to do that. Okay, so the probability of these laws that lead to life, the four forces, is you know, being caused by God Swinburne thinks is just much greater than, than not happening. And look, if this is true, that that probability is much, much stronger, that a higher probability, if that's true, I give it two dots. I think it supports that God exists. I'll just lay that out right now. Like, I think that, that this is true, assuming it's true. I do think it's pretty good reason to believe that, that God exists. Now, here's 1B, and there's not, nothing really supporting it here. Um, but it's important to Swinburne, so I put it in. If that, if there's a God that desires the development of life, then the probability of this ultimate LTLTL as caused by God is greater than the property of LTLTL happening to natural causes. So, so you might like be thinking, if especially if if you don't believe in God and you're an atheist, you might be thinking, well, uh, yeah, I agree. There's laws that lead to life, but why does it have to come from God? Good question. And um, and Swinburne just thinks, well, it's just a much higher probability that it comes from God than, than otherwise, especially if the God wants the development of life. All right, now over here, and I think this is true. It strongly supports that. Uh, finally, the third one here is the organized universe must have had a beginning point. Now, that's only one dot. I think that's weak. Even if it's true, why does it have to be God? Right? Like, why can't it be some weird alien or something else? Does it have to be a god that did that? This this recurs through even the cosmological argument this comes up. You know, with Taylor and Mackey or uh, or William Craig and Mackey. Uh, now, there is an assumption here that, uh, and I put a question mark on it, that order rather than disorder exists. I mean, if you look at my desk, that's not the case. Entropy is disorder. But overall, the universe produces order. Um, that's a question mark because maybe outside, maybe, you know, what is the uh, container that we're looking at? Is it the entire universe has order or all reality might be like chaotic, but the universe might be temporarily in order, <laughs> but in the larger picture, it might be disorder. So that's why I put a question mark there. Again, I'm going quickly here. You can always pause and rewind and such. All right. Now, which one should we look at next in terms of the reasons for it? We're really between 1A and 1C. 
Uh, this is gonna. This is a lot here. So let's look at one C because this will go a little more quickly. So here we go. Um, move that over. Um, why it must have a beginning point? Well, there's an opposition, and I think it's weak by Stephen Hawking. Um, the universe is not infinitely old, right? Um, and it's not, and it also did not have a beginning. Like, like, so Hawking's like, yeah, it's not infinitely old, but it didn't have a beginning. Like, like Stephen Hawking, um, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He says it didn't have a beginning. If you click on this link in here, string theory, it'll bring you to like a, I think it's a Nova website that has all kinds of videos for you about this very topic. All right. Let's, let's see what's going on here. Now, now Hawking, Hawking, Hawking gives a reason for it. By the way, Richard Swinburne is summarizing Hawking's argument. And notice that good philosophers do that. They will summarize the arguments of philosophers who might disagree with them. I respect that. Swinburne's doing that. I think he's doing a fairly good job here. Now, why? I've got this horrible image. What looks like a, I don't know, some kind of odd piece of pottery. What it is, if I recall correctly, what it is is a... Uh, a fourth dimensional object um, and there is a fancy name for it and math math mathematicians um, in the area of topology work with this I think it's called the Riemann curve but I'm not positive all right Hawking's fourth option is space is closed right it's finite but it has no boundary the three dimensions is like a two-dimensional surface of a sphere right you take a two-dimensional surface, I don't know, here's a two-dimensional surface, and then I can bend it into a ball. I mean, this is a piece of paper, it's kind of hard, but I could bend it into a ball, and now I create a three-dimensional. The two dimensions can be bent into a three-dimensional ball. So you can take the three dimensions that we live in and then bend that into a sphere. I can't imagine that. Maybe I can't imagine that because my brain is evolved to like navigate and visualize in three dimensions. So this is where we need mathematicians to help us. Okay, 3D is like 2D surface of a sphere even with time. So if you keep going into the future and time itself is also uh, curved according to this, I, according to Hawking per Swinburne's summary of Hawking. And you have to always be careful because sometimes when philosophers paraphrase or summarize another person's point of view, or someone like Stephen Hawking's view, they might be wrong, right? They might get it wrong. So that's always that's always something to try to, to, to check. Okay, so if time itself is curved, it means that in the future, I'll at some point in the future, I'll be born again. And at some point in the future, like, I'll be making this video again. And at some point in the future, you'll be watching this video again. And then Oh my God, that's going to go on forever. Um, Friedrich Nietzsche had something to say on this issue called, with, with his concept of the eternal recurrence. Kind of related. All right. Now, uh, Swinburne, though, he doesn't like this uh, because he doesn't want... What, what's the issue with Swinburne? He doesn't like the idea that the universe does not have a beginning. Like, Swinburne wants the universe to have a beginning. Um, and we also get that from the cosmological argument, right? Okay, so uh, there's two objections here. A theory which entails a contradiction can't be true. Okay, fine. Um, he says cyclical time is just not possible. Like you can't have, you, you can't have time be bent. You know, time can't be curved such that the future curves into the past. You can't have that. Why? Um, because he just thinks it's absurd, right? that that in the future I'll be born. He, he, Swinburne just finds this to be a logical contradiction. Um, also, Haw Hawking can't rule out the logical possibility, and the logical possibility is um, anything that you can imagine. Uh, I can literally imagine in my head that there's some like elephant floating above my house right now in Modesto. Like, I, so therefore, it's actually logically possible. Uh, that's the quick way of understanding this concept, logical possibility. Philosophers use it a lot. Hawking can't rule out the logical possibility of a god who either maintains the current set of laws 
Um, whether the laws are the result of the beginning or an everlasting cycle. In other words, another way of looking at this is we can imagine the universe had a beginning and was created by God. Therefore, Hawking is on no grounds to say this is impossible. All right. Um, that's this strand. I'm going to close that. We're done with that. Now we only, there's no reason supporting that. So now we, all we have left is 1A. But you'll see this is, there's a lot. So the next level of 1A, we see that, in my opinion, there's two reasons that only weakly support it. By the way, that means that this whole argument is, is floundering, in my opinion. Um, that is Swinburne's argument. But let's see why. Uh, uh, 2A here, it's extremely improbable that nature, and let me fix that, um, that nature on its own, whoops, sometimes there's a typo, that nature on its own created um, the ultimate, oh boy, okay, created the ultimate fine-tuned LTLTL, right? Um, Whatever this is, is, well, we know what it is. The ultimate laws that lead to life, right? Remember that? Gravity, strong weak nuclear force, um, electromagnetism. It's just really unlikely that that was created by nature. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? And I'm thinking of the supporting ones. Evolution. What about evolution? Evolution is distraction from the real design issue. Yeah, so you might be wondering, especially if you're familiar with intelligent design arguments, creationism, arguments like that. Why is Swinburne not like talking about evolution? Isn't that what intelligent designers and creationists focus on? Many do, not Swinburne. And I think Swinburne's really smart. You know, I, I really respect him for not, uh, you know, not focusing on evolution. So Swinburne's like, evolution is a distraction. It's not about evolution. The issue is not about evolution. Just don't worry about evolution. That's just a partial explanation. It's really about the ultimate explanation, which is the laws of physics, including those four forces. So, so this is 2A is like really important. Now, before we get into 2A, let's take a look at this. There's an objection. that This is an objection raised by Swinburne. And again, that's what philosophers also do. They often object to their own views, right? Um, and why are they doing that? Because they know they're trying to read the mind. In a way, they're following the tracks of the argument, but they're also reading the mind of the, of the reader. Like, they can kind of figure out what the reader's thinking and then head them off at the pass. So again, that's a mark of a good philosopher, honestly, where they're able to anticipate objections, raise them, and deal with them. And that way, the idea is that they will also get more uh, the reader's respect. Okay, so... If God exists, then God would just mouse click everything into existence. That's my term for this. But, you know, the idea of uh, certain versions of creationism, and there's many versions of it, is that literally what we call species or breeds or whatnot, which is like at some, like, go back to Genesis of the uh, Old Testament. At some point, God just like, you know, mouse clicked everything, like all the flower. Like God made it all, and he's like, you know, my analogy is it's like he had a mouse on a on a screen and he's clicking everything into existence. And when and when God makes these species or 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 um or breeds or whatnot, you know, dogs and animals and snakes and so forth and plants and flowers, God makes them fully formed. You know, maybe there's a little change within the <laughs> within the species, maybe, and there's different like versions of creationism and design on that. But the big picture is they're basically, um, yeah, but the big picture here is, um, is that God generally will create different kinds, species, whatnot, and they're, you know, as, as fully formed. They didn't arise through natural selection and variation over hundreds of millions of years, like I began my uh, lecture, right, with the Bakersfield 2 uh, Baker Station journey. It didn't happen like that. Um, it happened mostly these things appeared fully formed. Now, this objection says, like, if God exists, like, why would God, like, 
if God, why would God do it this way? Like, why would God, you know, create the laws that lead to life and then like allow it to unfold instead of just cutting to the chase and like making everything? Like, this just seems like if God exists, it just seems like a strange way for God to create us through the Big Bang and billions of years and that night, that whatever, that trip from uh, a 200 mile journey from Bakersfield to the Earth. And then like another 90 miles of slime developing into simple animals, right? That I just went through with you. God, that. And then you're just one millimeter on that whole journey. Like that just seems really complicated. Like why wouldn't God just create everything fully formed? Um, that's, you know, that's a good point. Now, um, Swinburne says against that, and notice this is an orange, right? It's against that. He's like, who's to say, you know, maybe God wasn't anthropocentric, right? Maybe he, you know, who's to say what God's like purpose is? He has all kinds of agendas or reasons. It might've been fun to watch the show, like, right? Also, he says God has a reason for creating embodied persons. Um through evolution and that when we have a physical body which we're kind of like losing because of zoom <laughs> i just didn't say that I'm kidding um because we have a uh, physical bodies you know we can we can grow in our knowledge and control the orderly world um also god had a reason to bring us about um god paints with a big brush from a large paint box uh, for the theist, physical laws lead to human evolution, right? So he's really, um, I'm going to close all, all that up. Um, you know, it just seems so complicated, but who's to say why God would do what God would do? So Swinburne is fine with evolution. He doesn't, he's not going to worry about how God made us. It doesn't matter. Um, now here is a really cool video. I'm just gonna just I just want you to let you know about the link. And if you click on that link, why is it not working for me? And oops. Uh, maybe it's not working because I'm on this video thing. I'll double check it, but check that out. It's an animation of the complexity of a life. What goes on in the life of a cell? And this video is often used um, by advocates of intelligent design because it is the case that the cell is unfathomably complex, okay? It is the case. Um, but, right? But we also know how much time evolution had to work with. 90 miles, right? Um, but that I see as maybe a weak argument to support that. That's why it gets one dot. Okay, now we are done. Um, we are done with 2B. Let's, uh, let's see. Let's look at, let's look at this here. Our next, uh, whoops. Oh yeah, okay, so sorry. Um, so we skipped over 2A. We just finished to be, um, and we also looked at, uh, yeah, let's take a look at this. Why is evolution a distraction from the real design issue? Like, why is Swinburne doing this? And he says, it's very simple. The evidence for evolution is like overwhelming, right? And then you can click on this link here. Yeah, the links aren't working because I'm in my video mode. Um, and this goes, brings you to the UC Berkeley site, and, you, and it's a very nice site that lays out the evidence for evolution. So Swinburne is like, yeah, Christians should accept evolution as completely true. And they don't need to worry about it because they can still have their cake and eat it too. You can accept evolution and still uh, be a uh, intelligent designer, for example, and, and have a rational argument for the existence of God. Um, now, you know, this is the other part. Evolution is not the ultimate explanation for life's complexity, you know, because evolution is based on LTLTL. Um, and there's the, actually, I want to just show this to you. There's an actual hierarchy, right? Where the laws of physics then determine the laws of chemistry, which determine the laws of evolution, which then lead to complex animal and human bodies. 
All right, that takes care of that thread. And let's close that up. Um, and now, now let's look at this because it's also short. Lapoid event. Now I'm incorporating Lapoid event into this um, argument map. So I'm doing two readings at once here. Uh, Lapoid event says there's zero chance that God exists, right? Or doesn't exist. This is interesting, right? There's just, and I gave it a kind of a strong objection. Why? He's just like, there's no chance of God existing, but there's also no chance that God doesn't exist. Like this idea, uh, and that's, so, so that idea that there's some like, the probability of LTL is caused by God is much greater. The point of that is saying, no, 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 there's like no probability either way. Why? Because the chance of God existing like makes no sense. It's just meaningless. Like why? Notice how this, this works, right? Uh, why? Because there's nothing we can point to which has a certain propensity to produce God. Okay, what does that mean? Whatever, so propensity is when you know all the initial conditions of a thing. Um, and, and, it's, and propensity is what we sometimes mean by the word chance. So the chance of something is going to be this propensity, and the propensity is all the initial conditions. So that goes back to the beginning of the lecture with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, player. If you had the camera on that, that machine on, they could know all the initial conditions, then he would know the propensity of the coin toss. All right. Um, the problem is that to say that there's a chance of God existing or not, assumes that we know all the initial conditions for the creation of God. Like, like that we know the propensity of God, like the initial conditions. But we don't know anything, like if there's a God or not. Like, we just don't know anything. We have zero knowledge of any of the initial conditions for the creation of God. Zero. Because we live in this universe. I gave you the tour, right? In terms of time. So... Uh, you can think about that. I think that's pretty good, right? Like, it's just silly to say that God, that to assign a probability of God existing or not. Like, that alone is because we don't know the conditions. We don't have the propensity. We can't, like, carry out an analysis of the propensity. All right, we've covered 2D, we've covered 2C, we've covered 2B, and we're now left with 2A. Let's just see the bigger picture here. Look at that. Nice. So we've covered everything except 2A. And I'm thinking, wow, are we almost done? No. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so 2A is extremely improbable that nature on its own created the ultimate fine-tuned LTLTL. That is what Swinburne's saying. I think it's weak. Um, now, against that is 3A. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal that the universe exists. Not a big deal. Now, why? Let's see if there's a green here. Yeah, there's a green. And I gave this actually a week, weekly supporting the objection. I'll do that on both sides, you know, based on what? Based on hopefully philosophy, uh, reasoning, rationality, philosophy, whatnot. Okay, there's something called the anthropic principle. This is one of your LRQ questions. Anthropic principle. That unless the universe exhibited the order that it does, like there would not be any humans alive to observe these laws. Like this is kind of like, duh. <laughs> so it's not a big deal because we humans can only like observe this universe and it's quote finely tuned LTLTL, right? Because we happen to have been created in a universe with these finely tuned laws. Like, like we're the product of that. So of course we can observe it. How can it be otherwise? We're here. Um, now, now this is fun. Uh, uh, Swinburne 
this is in, in the Swinburne reading. And again, you know, he was the one bringing up this objection, right? The objection of really the anthropic principle objection. He now opposes the anthropic principle. He has an argument against it, and it's kind of fun. And, and I think if this is true, it's pretty strong as an objection, and I think it would knock out the anthropic principle. So what is it? Um, it's a big deal because it's very, very unlikely to have been caused by natural events. Like our fine tune, and this is like a, this is a little bit like, what do I want to say? Uh, biasing the argument, fine tuned, right? It's already, in, there's already an innuendo there that there's a designer. Nothing's fine tuned unless there's a designer. Our fine tuned universe, LTLTL universe, is like a madman card shuffling machine thought experiment. Like, what? So let's look at the madman shuffling machine thought experiment, and here it is. Um, that's a card shuffler. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know why anyone would get that. Oh, I guess they, they deal with that in Tahoe, right? Vegas? Is that what they do? Okay. Say a madman kidnaps a victim, shuts them in the room with a card shuffling machine, and it shuffles 10 different packs of cards, so they're all randomly shuffled, then tells the victim to draw one card randomly from each pack. Uh, you know, I think Swinburne's saying something like this, right? If the victim draws an ace of hearts from every shuffled pack, then the victim will live. Like, imagine that's the situation, like, like, like some kind of like, I don't know, horror movie, James Bond movie, right? Where the the villain, the evil villain, Batman, I don't know, all those movies, but the evil villain, the Joker, ah, you know, here's 10 card shuffling machines, and once they're done shuffling, the victim must pull a random card from all 10, and the evil madman says, if you don't pull an ace of hearts from every deck, all 10 decks, then you die. And what happens is that the victim pulls an ace of hearts from every deck. Like, what would, like, what would you conclude if that happened? Like, seriously, if this happened to you and you pulled an ace of hearts from 10 decks that were all randomly shuffled by a machine like that, right? This isn't like a person who's tweaking it. This is the machine that does it. Like, what would you conclude? You you probably would conclude, like, what's the cause for that? Probably that um, some spiritual divine god, right, intervened and, you know, rigged all the machines for you so you would live. Like, like you would probably conclude that God exists. And, and like, maybe you should. Do you know what the probability of this happening, right? The probability of 10 randomly shuffled decks, you get the same card for every one of them, all 10. The probability for that, I don't, you know, it's like what, one divided by 52 times, one divided by 52, 10 times. That's 52 times itself, 10 times, I think. As a denominator. Um, if you've taken a stat class, this is an easy one. It's astronomically small. If that happened, I, I, I really do think you should kind of believe in God. Okay, or something like that. That'd be crazy. All right, so Swinburne is saying that our universe is fine-tuned because he's saying that the chances that we would get the LTLTL thing, where is it, up here? The chances of this is like, a, is like the same as like the chances of getting like 10 ace of hearts from 10 decks of cards. The chances of getting laws that lead to life, not just any old laws, but law, laws that lead to life, gravity, right? Electromagnetism and so forth. The chances of getting that is like getting, pulling 10 ace of hearts. What's cool about this, you know, is we can really visualize it and that allows us to like enter into the argument in a more dramatic way and I think in a more interesting way. And it allows you, I know this is a lot, it is, but it allows you if you just follow through with this and you can, you use that little pause button on me, right? <laughs> if this allows you to be on an equal footing with the philosophers. And really, I, I think this is, you can't get much better than 
than the complexity of this argument, right? If this is a question that's been bugging you and it does bug a lot of people, um, I think this is about as bad, good as you can do it. Okay, so it's like that. Now, now, why though? Like, like what, what's this basis for that? Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, let, let's look over here. Whoops. I do want to know what's, what the basis of that is. Um, and I'm going to hold off on that. Um, but I'll, uh, we'll come to it. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So we have this here. And now let's look over at this side of 2A. Remember the opposition, dude, it's not really a big deal. Um, I'm going to close this for a second. The, the reason to support that it's extremely improbable is that our universe is fine-tuned. Um, it's, what does that mean? It means that the law of grav the gravitational force is like just right. It means that the weak and strong nuclear forces are like just right. They're forces. They could be strong or weak than they are now, right? Every force, like here's the force of gravity. It's like it, it makes, it makes stuff fall. The force could be a little stronger and then things would fall faster, right? Or a little weaker and be... So let's keep that in mind. You may have never thought about this, but the force of gravity could have been stronger or weaker. And yes, the experience of the force of gravity varies depending on the planet you're on. You know, the moon, it's... it's uh, we experience it as a, as a weaker force. Uh, this is complicated, but... That's because of the mass of, of the moon, right? Relative to the person. But the force is still the same. But it could have been weaker or stronger, like these forces. Um, right? And here's the reason for this. Like, if the laws of physics varied by just one part in a million, whoa. Right? If gravity was off by one part in a million, we, we never would have had galaxies or planets. I'm going to say that again. If gravity was just, the force of gravity varied by like one part in a million. You can check with your physics instructor, your astronomy instructor on this. We wouldn't have galaxies or planets. Wow. Um, and here's a link, a really cool link uh, by the um, camera company Nikon that puts the whole universe in scale for you. It's like a website that you can play with. It's really cool. So check that out. Uh, let me say it again, okay? We get it. The fine tune is a simple idea. If we just modify these fundamental laws, the LTLTL, the laws that lead to life, just by a minute amount, one part in a million, we wouldn't have galaxies or planets. It would just be like a mass of primitive soup. That's what Swinburne says. All right, now there is a, a counter argument. Let's look at it now. It's called the many worlds theory, and and this says uh, the many worlds the many worlds worlds theory says look, it's true. It's true that if we vary, like nobody disagrees with that. By the way, that is true uh, about these laws, right? If you vary them a little bit, we don't get galaxies and planets. But the objection to that is it's inevitable that we're going to have some universe somewhere with that because there's zillions of universes. It's called the many worlds theory. There's just zillions of them. And, and among all these zillions of universes, you're going to get one out of the zillion where the forces are, are just so, so that we get us. In a way, this is a version of the anthropic principle. Okay, and it's because there are trillions and trillions of universes with all kinds of possible kinds of order and disorder, right? This is trillions of them out there. We're not, we're just one. Okay, um, there's a, there's a, a opposition to that. This is Swinburne, and I gave it like, this here means that it's null. Like, I just think this is a horrible objection. Swinburne says, it's just irrational to say that. <laughs> No, I want to know why it's, it's irrational. Um, it's irrational to say there's trillion universes rather than one God. Maybe it'd be a little better if he said it's just as irrational. Um, okay. 
Now, there's a better uh, opposition to this. Um, and Swinburne says, look, Maybe the total population is just, just one. Like, who's to say that there's trillions of universes? Like, how do we know that? We don't. We don't know how many universes there are. We do not know because we have not gone outside our universe, right? We don't know. So it might be one. The point of then, though, you know, this is clever. He would object to um, Swinburne's objection. An objection to an objection is like an affirmation, right? Not, not. If I, if I do not not want to have a donut, donut, or dessert, if I do not not want a donut, then I do. See how that works? So the not of the not affirms this up here is what's going on. Um, the point of end, like, okay, but, you know, if there's just one universe, then you can't assign a probability because of the nature of propensity. We talked about propensity. If there's just one universe, then we don't have access to the initial conditions, so you can't assign a probability. So the point of end is very clever. Like he's saying to Swinburne, be very careful, like when you argue this, because you are undermining your own argument ultimately. All right. Now we just dealt with the many worlds theory, right? That against the fine tuned. Um. And now let's go back to what we were working on before. Um, let's see. Oh, over here. Dude, it's not a big deal, right? Now, we said here we had the shuffling of the card experiment. And then uh, Lepoy Deven says that Swinburne is making a false analogy. Okay, this is where this is going to be the last part of this. Uh, big lecture. Now, design argument is not really dealing. Let me make this bigger for you. Okay, so the design argument is not dealing with light bulbs, and it's not. It's not like the madman shuffling machine. Now, the point of it also says it's like not like the light bulb. Now, what, what's the light bulbs? Let's look over here for the light bulbs. Um, and the idea here is, if we say, um you know, the anthropic principle, an, an opposite, uh, something against the anthropic principle is like, we should believe what's most probable, right? That's kind of part of, that's kind of united with 5A. 5A is like, it's just really unlikely per the shuffling card trick thing, the shuffling experiment, it's really unlikely that we would get our universe with its forces, right, attuned just so. And then 5B is like, I always go with what's most likely in life. Like, And the reason for that, and this is in the Swinburne article, is it's called the broken lamp bulb. If there's an electric circuit, right, like through your house, shared by multiple lights, and one lamp does not go on when you put the light switch on, but all the other lights work, the most likely explanation is that the bulb has blown out on the light that doesn't turn on. Like, that's the most likely hypothesis. Now, there are other possible reasons why the light doesn't go on when you turn it on, even though all the other lights do. Like, maybe there's a broken cable. Um, maybe there's a switch broken in the lamp. Um, maybe a mouse chewed through the cable. Like, those, there are other possible explanations. This is important. Um, now, what should you believe when you, like, this is kind of cool by Swinburne, like, what should you believe when you turn on your lamp, it doesn't go on, but all the other lights go on, on that circuit? You should believe that you need to go get another light bulb. You shouldn't start, like, you shouldn't, like, call an electrician right away, right, about that lamp. You shouldn't, like, start pulling apart the wires. Just get another light bulb. Why? Because that's the most probable. Therefore... Because this works with lamps and, and a lot of things in everyday life that we problem solve. Therefore, we should always go with what's most probable, with, with what we believe. By the way, uh, the, 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 uh, what supports the broken lamp bulb example is that we know the background assumptions, right? 
the background assumptions are presumed. The initial conditions of this lamp, like the laws of physics, how electricity flows through tungsten wire, and that there's no mice eating through random lamp cords. Like, we're assuming that. Okay, that's kind of cool. I kind of like that. That is how we think in an everyday, everyday sense. We believe a lot of things that we don't know 100%. Uh, the vaccine. Um, I can't wait to get the vaccine. Is it going to protect me 100%? No. Um, am I still going to get it? Yes. Why? Because it has a 95%, if it's a Pfizer vaccine, 95% probability of protecting me. Okay, so I'm going to get it because of that, even though it's not 100%. This is real life. This is how we reason. Therefore, right? Therefore, we should believe what is most likely or most probable. All right. And then you combine that with like, it's extremely unlikely that our fine tuned universe, you know, came about through natural events. Okay. Then we should believe then we should not believe the anthropic, right? We should like reject that. And then we, and then we should, and then, and that means that we really wouldn't say it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. And then ultimately this is going to get us to like, it's improbable. And then that's going to get us like to God, right? Okay. Um, now let's now finally go back to this. Um, the point of N is like, this is the big, 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 I think it's strong. He's like, the universe is not like lamps. The probability of the universe existing, the probability really of LTLTL, right? Those four forces being what they are and, to, and, and having the exact force that they have. It's not like the shuffling machine and it's not like the lamp. Those are false analogies. It's not like that. Why? Um, the, the point of end says that the reasoning about the creation of our universe requires context, contextual knowledge of the fundamental laws and that the, and that the constants and rules of probability don't apply. Probability doesn't apply. You can't, you can use probability with lamps. You can use probability with, 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 uh, with card playing and drawing a card from a deck. You can, but you can't use it with the universe. Probability does not apply with like the beginning of the universe. And that's what Swinburne misses. This is a pretty, I think it's a pretty strong argument by Lepoy Devin. Why? Because the background assumptions are unknown. Like we just, it's impossible to talk about the probability of the laws themselves. Why? Um, well, you know, because, and this is my, uh, I think it's strong. The background conditions are unknown. Like we just don't know anything. We have no data. We just don't know anything at all. Like what happens quote before the big bang quote before the big bang. We just don't know. All right. Now Swinburne does not agree with this. Uh, he has an objection. I actually think it's strong if it's true. And Swinburne's objection is that, you know, we, we can know the background conditions. So of all the possible universes, like maybe 1% are pro-life LTLTL and 99% are just like weird universes. Like nothing, no, nothing happens. They're like dud universes, right? They're anti-LTL, LTLTL. So the chance of our pro-life existing is like really small. Unless there's a God that is a pro-life God that desires a pro-life universe. It's on page 116. I think this is a strong objection against the point of end. Um, now, but there's reasons for it. Let's, whoa, let's see what's going on. The many worlds theory. Aha, uh -huh, we already covered that. So notice how we're bringing that back again in the argument. Now, uh, Lepoy Devin says, and I want to make sure it's clear, Lepoy Devin objection to objection, right? Um, Lepoy Devin says that chance, the word chance is ambiguous. It has two meanings. Um, it can either mean frequency or it can mean propensity. And furthermore, both fail to measure the probability of like a pro-life universe happening without God 
or to even compare probabilities of like a God universe versus an atheist universe. Like there's no way to do it with either view of chance. So guess what Lapoy de Venn's gonna do? He's now gonna like unpack these two meanings of chance. Really, really interesting. The first is, let's do this one because we've already talked about it. The propensity model of chance can't be used. I think you should hopefully know what's gonna happen here. Um, because, I'll look at 12b, the chance of something happening is due to the properties of the thing, right? Because, it was our coin toss, the chance of the coin landing is not 50% through, prop, through propensity. It's actually 0 or 100% or 0 percent if you know all the conditions. That goes back to the football, you know, the the uh, Super Bowl uh, example I gave at the beginning of the lecture. All right. Secondly, the chance that we measure when we assign a probability is because we ignore the initial conditions of the coin toss. It's too complicated. I've already kind of stated that. Now, there is an objection here. This is that Lapointe event mentions. This is an interesting objection. I thought it was strong that maybe the real chance isn't, maybe that's wrong. Maybe the real chance is not 100% or zero because maybe you, maybe the universe, the world's indeterminate. Like maybe at the quantum level, you, you can never measure all the conditions. So you really, in the end, don't know <laughs> the coin toss. Okay, I'm going to leave that for you to think about. If you want to play with that more, maybe some extra credit for you there. If you if you're still hanging in there with this video, all right. So that's 12C. We've covered that. 12B. We've covered that. Um, now let's look at uh, the circular reasoning fallacy. The teleological argument assumes that it has to prove that that the properties that create the universe are actually known. Uh, it's called circular reasoning. Um, now this is, uh, that's Le Point de Ven here. Now, now here's an objection to that. If one assumes that a God that desires a pro-life universe exists, right, then you, then you must know the probability that such a God will create such a universe is much more probable than if no God. Okay. Um, however, there's, there's no way to assign the probability of pro-life universe because the initial conditions are unknown on the on, on an atheist model, maybe on any model. All right. Um, I want to look at. Let's see. Unless let's review all these here. Um, okay. This was all the pop. This 11b was propensity, and I kind of went over that. Um, and now we have one last thread here, which is, remember we said the chance, the Lapointe event's objection is that chance can be frequency or propensity. I think he has a pretty strong argument here, if this is true, and I think he supports it pretty well. This fails, you know, that supports his objection. But let's also look at frequency or statistical probability. Lapointe event says that the frequency view of chance cannot be used to compare a God versus an atheist universe probability. Why? 12a, frequency does not measure the chance of something happening on its own. Frequency only says how something occurs in a part of a whole, right? So whenever you're measuring the frequency, it's, it's a frequency of what's called a population, which is the frequency of an event happening among all the events or all the individuals of a population. And to do that, you have to like analyze a subset of the population that's called a sample. And the idea is that you have to have a large enough sample, right, that is randomly distributed from the population in order to infer about the characteristics of the population. In order to assign a probability by frequency. Um, okay, that's 12a. 12b, like the no, now, now, so let's look at that. Um, like, here's a quick example for you. Soup. If a, if a pot of soup is a population, right? And you want to know if the soup is ready to eat. The cook isn't going to like drink all the soup. That would be like ridiculous. So how does the cook know that the entire population of all the soup molecules is ready to eat? The soup 
stirs the soup first so that every component of the soup is reflects the population, right? You gotta stir the soup so that when you take a sample of the soup called a spoonful, that spoonful is is a um, accurate, faithful representation of the whole pot because the spoonful is a randomly distributed ran, randomly distributed sample of the entire pot. So you stir the soup, which is the population. You take your spoon. I have a spoon here. Yeah, here's a spoon. Here's my, here's my soup. Here's my spoon. I dip into the soup, and now I have my sample of the soup, right? And then I taste it. Mm. And I say, "Wow, that you know that it's ready to go." And then, and then, and then, then I know that the pot of soup is ready to go. Now, that only works right if the population, the soup, the pot of soup is bigger than the sample, the spoon. It also only works if the spoon is like big enough. Like in this context with soup, a spoonful is big enough as long as you start the soup. Does this make sense? So if we want to measure the frequency, the probability frequency wise of the LTLTL being finely tuned or being just so, we need to compare that to the total population of all universes. So our universe would be the sample, the little spoon, right? And then we're going to compare that to the population of all universes. And then we can figure out the probability. And then if it's really small, we might say, yeah, God exists. Because then we would know the probability in terms of frequency that the universe exists or not. Well, you got a problem. What is our population size of universes that we can observe? Like a pot of soup, there it is, I see it, right? What's the population of universes that we can observe? One, ours. It's not like we don't have like photographs of other universes. One, shit. Okay, so what else? What's our sample size? It's us, one. You, you can't, you cannot measure frequency if the sample is one and the population is one. It's called an N of one. You can't, you really can't, it's really illegitimate to do it whenever the sample is one, you know, when the population is large. So if the population of the universe is large and our sample is one, which is all that we're observing, but we don't even know the size of the population of universes, you know, the many worlds theory. We don't know. The known, so here we go, 12B, the known population of the universe is one, the sample is one, so there's no way to, frequent, uh, way to measure it. Uh, the frequency theory requires that greater than one, this is what I just said. Uh, frequency theory, it's just telling you how that works, okay? So I think this is really strong, right? Um, Right, so the chance of our universe sustaining life is 100%, in a way, if you really want to do this. So you can't use this model. You really, you also can't use a propensity model. So these are really strong for saying that Lapointe event, I think he's right, right? Like, uh, we just can't measure the probability of the background conditions supporting LTLTL. Um, I'm backing up here, right? We're going, we're back, backtracking to what we covered. Uh, we just can't do it. Look at this. I'm opening everything up. You'll see why in a minute. Um, make sure I covered everything. Yeah. All right, all of this we covered. Um, 
including evolution, right? Uh, there's one more. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty quick. I keep saying that. This is fun, though. Oh no, we actually did cover this. The universe, the, or the uh, universe must have the starting point. By the way, I did. Well, I know what it is. I wanted to show you this picture. How cool is that? That's science's current understanding of the universe. You know that that uh, trip from uh, Bakersfield all the way to um, Baker Station and the Sierras. That 310 mile journey is this. So here's the big bang with a with a big ex or expansion. It's really not a bang. Thirteen point eight billion years, and you know you notice here there's like a there's like initially like a plasma. Um, it's not like all the stars and galaxies appeared right away. Um, and even for that, I think for the first couple hundred thousand years, maybe three hundred thousand years, there was no light because um, I think my understanding is that the gravity the force of gravity is so strong even light couldn't escape and it's not until there was some cooling that light could escape so there's like a plasma here and then you have like you know early galaxies and then galaxy evolution and galaxies themselves like go through stages so it's not just like life evolving it's, it's also the universe and, and stages evolving this is really important for a class like this because usr ultimate sacred reality is about Ultimately, I do think it's about the nature of the universe and our place in it and our temporary place in it. All right. Um, that is the big picture. Let me now zoom out so you can see. This is a very cool uh, program. Hopefully, you can see why I use it. You know, this is the entire map that you just walked through for an hour and 15 minutes. That's not bad. Uh, and what I would do is walk through this through this map on your own, use this video, just to just make sure that you are asking yourself honestly, do you understand the argument? And I think if you put the time in, you can because you've got the video and you got the argument map. Just reading it alone in the text is pretty hard. You know, you can also outline you know readings um, on your Word document or Google Doc document, but when you outline and you realize that the logical structure is confusing, it's hard to rearrange things. This program allows you to rearrange components of the argument. And I did a lot of that when I made this, right? I read through it, I took notes, I annotated, I created my initial uh, map of the argument of both Lepoy Devin and Swinburne, and then I actually rearranged it so that it would make more sense. You might be able to improve on my argument map a little bit, um, actually. You know, while I was going through this, in my mind, I was like, mm, maybe I should move this around a bit. Notice how you can do it. Watch. This whole thing I can just attach over here. See that? But I don't want to, I don't want to do that. It's fine the way it is, but you can rearrange this. You can even create sub maps and sub pages with this. So this is quite complicated, um, but it's giving you the, 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 the full picture, I think, of the, both Swinburne and Le Poy de Ven. And, um, and yeah, I'm going to end this video. I, I hope this was helpful. A uh, reminder about uh, Zoom office hours. Uh, if you're confused by any of this, um, feel free to sign up and come talk to me. Okay, I hope this was helpful and have a great um, upcoming weekend.